Welcome to Dr. Karen Speaks Leadership. The show for you, the successful, savvy, senior business leader. Featuring the music of national recording artist, Ron McMillan. And I am your host, Dr. Karen Wilson-Starks. Hi, I'm Dr. Karen Wilson-Starks, welcoming you to our inaugural show focused on executive leadership. And you are in the right place if you are a successful, savvy, senior corporate leader. Now, when I say senior, I'm really not referring to age. Rather, I'm talking about experience, experience leading in organizations. So you might hold the title of president, CEO, executive vice president, or you might be responsible for creating culture, developing people, and or launching and developing high performance teams. If so, then this show is for you. If you are newer to leadership, or perhaps you want to build your successful, savvy, senior leadership skills and perspectives, then stay tuned because we've got something for you as well. So in each of the shows that we will be featuring, I will be leveraging my more than 45 years of adult working experience, as well as my more than 30 years of consulting in executive leadership development to Fortune 500 companies. So I want to provide you with some practical tips, insights, and ideas that you can implement in your business today. So that's what we're all about. In today's show, I'm really planning to share our framework for success. And that framework, we refer to it as five hallmarks of the successful leader. And you might be wondering, well, what are those five hallmarks? Those five hallmarks are, number one, lead yourself first, develop you. Number two, develop other successful leaders. And then number three, create a succession process, and four, launch and develop high performance teams. Number five, create a success culture. So let's start with the first one, lead yourself first. In my book, Lead Yourself First, the Senior Leader's Guide to Engaging Your People for Greater Performance and Impact, I talk about the importance of first starting with yourself. So what does that mean? What does it mean to lead yourself first? What I'm talking about is for you as the leader to look in the mirror, for you to take stock of yourself, identify what are your strengths, what are your development needs, what are the things that perhaps you might need to work on. It's about being proactive, proactive about your growth, proactive about your development, and it's about really recognizing that the business environment today is very dynamic. So we're not looking at a static business environment, so your old learning is not enough. It's gonna be very important then to see what you can learn new every day. So let me give you an example. In my profession, I'm educated and trained as a clinical psychologist. And as a clinical psychologist, I have to maintain my license every year. That means it's very important for me to take a certain number of continuing education credit hours. Now, I actually always exceed that minimum. And the reason I exceed that minimum is because I know that my clients actually deserve my best. So I want to make sure that I'm constantly learning every day and I'm bringing in the best in my industry, the best of the knowledge that's out there to you. And the same is true for you in your business, in your organization. You also want to be learning every day and bringing in the best. So daily hone your skills, bring your A game. This is really not about doing the minimum. 
This is about keeping pace and even going beyond that. So as a leader, also remember that you too are modeling the way for other people who are following you. So if they see you developing yourself, it's a much easier conversation to talk to them about developing themselves. And that's where we're headed next. So point number two is really about developing other successful leaders. So when we're thinking about other people and their leadership, we're really talking about identifying the strengths and also the gaps that they bring to the job and to the table. We're talking about focusing on helping them to grow, to become all that they really can be. It's about you as that senior leader providing tools and resources for them to actually do the job. And not only tools and resources to do the job better, it's more successfully, more effectively, but tools that also help them to grow personally as leaders. That's also very important. So you want to think about it this way. You are giving something to them and you are pouring into those who work in your organization because guess what? Every day they are pouring into you and into your business and into the results that you're asking them to provide. Now, if we fail to do this, it's very similar to expecting a car to go when you don't put gas in it. So if you want that high-powered car to go, you've got to fuel it. You've got to put energy in it. So when you think of your people, think about them the same way. How can you build into them and into their development? So one of the key principles behind all of this, and one of the principles I share with my clients and certainly with you is this, support what you build. So let's say you're installing a new IT platform in your organization. This system is gonna require new learning and it's gonna require some new training on the part of your workforce. So as you're building it and as you're purchasing it, think on the front end about what's gonna be important as far as what that training looks like. And it's gonna be different kind of training for different people. So for, there are some people who can read those manuals on IT and be very comfortable with that. There are others who are gonna to wanna to have more of an apprenticeship system, somebody sitting right there with them, somebody else is gonna watch a video and that's gonna be what they prefer. And from someone like me, I want the 1-800 number that I can call in the middle of the night when I'm having problems. So the point is, support what you build in multiple ways, multiple platforms, multiple formats. We also know that a big way that people develop and grow on the job is through the challenging assignments that you give them. The Center for Creative Leadership actually does a lot of research where that research shows that people learn the most. They learn the most from the challenging jobs that they actually do in the workplace. So think about that. You may be having some individuals who are moving from an individual contributor role. Maybe they're scientists. And perhaps now you're asking them to be a, a leader of people. Well, you know, those are very different skill sets. And so in supporting that person to make the transition, you're going to also want to not only provide them the technical support for their scientific role, but also the support that helps them to develop their leadership skills as well. So that's what we're talking about. So one of the things you want to keep in mind is what would it really feel like if you're on the job and you're trying to do the best that you can every day and it feels as though you're being thrown in to the deep end of the swimming pool when you don't know how to swim at all. That's very challenging. Now on the other hand, let's say you do know how to swim and you're swimming in five feet. So to be thrown into the deep end, that's not as frightening because you do have the foundational, the basic swimming skills. And so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about assessing your people. Where are they? And figuring out what is the next best step for that person. What is the next best step for them? And it may not be being thrown into the deep end of the swimming pool. All right, so that's a little bit about, two developing other successful leaders. So let's move on to point three. Point three is about creating a succession process. 
So think today about what your organization is actually going to need tomorrow. How are you going to grow today's leaders to be ready for that future? So if I think right now about those clients of mine who are in the banking field, those who are in the banking industry right now, they are creating much more tech-based, automated, user-driven solutions. They're creating agile formats and going paperless, and it's very different from the kind of banking environment that let's say my father would have been used to many years ago. So as they're ramping up into this new world that's much more client driven and much more independent on the part of clients and paperless and 24 hour and so many other aspects that requires different skills from those who are working in the banking industry. So they're very quickly dialing that in and thinking about how can we even recruit in the future the kind of person who really is going to want to work in this environment and has the skills to be successful in this environment? You also want to think about sometimes as you're looking at the future, the people you have today are not the ones who are going to be able to go with you into the future. Now, I'm really all for developing everyone to the level that they can possibly get to the maximum of what they can get to. Yet at the same time, sometimes your business focus is going to shift, it's going to change, and it's going to require you to recruit a very different kind of person. So let me give you an example. I did have a client at one time who was actually was a large nonprofit foundation. And the way that foundation was structured, they hired program officers who had a real passion for the work of the foundation. And because they had that passion, they were not only grant makers, but they were also operators. They operated programs that the foundation supported. Now the foundation changed its emphasis and decided to move from operating to actually doing solely grant making so that the operators were not the program officers, but people in the community. When they made that shift, they discovered then that some of their current employees really didn't want to just be doing the administrative function of grant making. They missed being the operators and developing and delivering the programs. So some of those actually left went back in the community and started running programs, and the foundation also had to begin to recruit people who like the more traditional just grant making of the foundation. So you will have those instances where you need a different kind of person on board and on the team. A third case in terms of planning for succession and planning for the future is something that happens very often in a family business. And family businesses can be large or small, and I have a number of clients who come from a family business background and direction. And one of the things they have to think about is how are we going to pass the leadership baton? And that becomes particularly crucial if passing that leadership baton means outside the family to more professional management. When that's the case, the family's got to figure out how they're going to exit, who are they going to bring in to ramp up with the skills that are necessary for running the business? And they have to bring in people who they trust and who are trustworthy. And they usually can't exit just suddenly all at once, but they have to also maintain a presence because the family is usually still going to be involved in some way in that family business. So these are so just a different angle on what succession might look like in a case like that. So the bottom line is that when you are building this bench strength in today's organization, it's really about creating an environment where you can float as many boats as possible in the organization. So you want to be thinking about maybe one person and think about a myriad of possible jobs that that person could be prepared for, possibly move into in the future. You also might want to think about for any single job, multiple people who possibly could do that job. And you might say, well, why do we have to do that? In the past, very often, one person was earmarked 
for one particular job opportunity in the future. What we find in today's climate, there is a lot of movement. People don't stay in the same company for 30 years as often as they did in the past. So you're going to have some people who are going to grow, they're going to develop with you, they're going to get great skills, and they may move on to another opportunity. And that's great because you want to be known as that kind of an organization that grows people in that way and that prepares them for the future and additional opportunity. But that also means you need a broader bench strength where you've got more than one person who you can consider for the key roles in your organization. You also want to think about the fact that maybe tomorrow you will need some roles that you haven't even thought about today. And so you want the people being prepared so that they can be very flexible and agile, able to move and to go to a different role that doesn't even exist right now. So this is really what we're talking about. We're really talking about laying, if you will, that kind of a foundation. All right, so let's move on to point number four, which is really launch and develop high performance teams. High performance teams do the bulk of the work in most organizations. And much of my work is really helping organizations to launch and develop these teams. Now here's the thing to be aware of. Failure to develop these teams is actually leaving opportunity on the table. So as an active duty Army officer back in my past life, and also as a psychologist at the same time, I saw, as a member of the Army, I saw a lot of teams. Some of those teams were high performance, and others were less so. And we're going to talk a little bit more in future shows, future episodes about high performance teams. So you'll hear more about that later. But for now, I'm just laying the foundation that this is a key ingredient for the successful leader and organization, and that is launching and developing high performance teams. So now let's talk a little bit about point number five, which is create a success culture. Creating a success culture means, number one, you've got the right people and you're properly developing both those individuals and those teams in the organizations so that you are then creating a learning culture. Now, there's a lot we could say about a learning culture, but I want to just mention a couple of points right now. First of all, a learning culture is feedback rich. That means people are giving positive feedback as well as developmental or maybe more negative feedback about what do we need to fix. And you really need both to be successful. You need some feedback that says, here's what's working well because you want to do more of that and you also need feedback about what's not working so well so that you can put some processes and some systems and some plans in place to address those things that are not working so well. Now what I find in my work is that very often organizations, they have kind of like dialed in real hard on what's not working well and frequently that's what they share with people and they don't remember that it's also important to give people that positive feedback so that they know what is working well. Because here's the fact, you get more of what you emphasize. You get more of what you emphasize. So I want to give an example. The other day I was talking to a woman who was applying for a job in the transportation industry. And it happened to be a company that was hiring bus operators. And one of the things that was interesting about this training is that the training was focused on all the ways that you could mess up, all the ways you could get fired for doing the wrong thing, all the ways that somehow you could mess up so severely you might even possibly get imprisoned. Can you imagine every day at work if your training is all about every misstep and everything that you could do wrong, you could become so constricted in your behavior that in every step you're probably tripping over something. You might actually even fall when normally you wouldn't fall because that's a very stressful and a very difficult culture. So this culture was negative, it was punitive, and unhelpful. So the woman who I was speaking with, 
she passed on that opportunity to join such a toxic organization and said, mm, I don't think so. And you know what? People out there today have many options. And you don't want them passing on your organization because you have set a very toxic culture. And so that's a little bit about what we are talking about. So let me say this, today's show is really all about taking an assessment of yourself as a successful leader. So I want you to think back to what we've been talking about and to really evaluate where do you stack up on these five hallmarks of the successful leader. So I'm gonna mention those hallmarks again. Number one, lead yourself first. Number two, develop others. Number three, create a succession process. In other words, think about the future and what you're gonna need, have people ready to fill in for that future. And number four, launch and develop high performance teams. Number five, create a success culture. So I want you to go back and I want you to grade yourself in each of these five areas. Are you an A student? What kind of grade would you give yourself in these five areas? What more can you learn to continue your journey as a successful, savvy senior leader? What more can you learn? I also want you to think about one action step from one or two of the five areas. And you might wonder, why am I saying just one or two and not all five? One of the things that we know is that people develop more effectively when they're focused on one or two, maybe maximally three things. But if you start focusing on too much, you end up not doing anything. So I'm gonna encourage you to pick one or two items. And if you pick the right one or two items, those will also be levers for change, very much like the domino effect. So if you hit one domino, it's gonna hit the other dominoes behind it, and you're going to have a reaction that sparks change throughout, and that's really what we're talking about. So pick maybe one or two areas. One of them I'm going to suggest be in the area of lead yourself first, because that's really crucial. You've got to always be looking at what's next for you and your own development. So I want you to think about that. What do you next need to develop to be even more effective than you are right now? So are you, for example, that person who's transitioning from that technical role and maybe you need to develop some leadership skills? Perhaps that's it. Perhaps you are that senior leader and you have all of this vision about things and it's clear in your head and maybe what you really need to develop is more skill on all the ways and the multiple times you have to communicate the message throughout the organization. Maybe that's the skill you might have to dial in. So I don't know what it is for you, but you think about it. Think about what is that one next step for you. Another example might be to think about the succession process in your organization, if that's relevant for you. But I'm just using this as an example to really ask the question about where is the organization going in the future? Who will we need? And what are we doing right now to pass the leadership baton in the future? So maybe you might assess a few points like that or some other area for your organization and it will lead you to identifying what may be your next best step in that category. So I want you to remember that this show is for you, the successful, savvy, senior leader. That means let me hear from you. I want to know what it is that you most want to explore and most want to hear about. So please send me emails with your questions, your thoughts, and your ideas about how I can serve you better. And best. You can reach me at Dr. Karen, that's Dr. D-R period, Karen, K-A-R-E-N, at transleadership.com. Now before you go today, I'd like to leave you with a thought for the day. So here's your thought. You are here for a reason, 
and you have something of value to contribute. So thanks again for joining me on today's show for Successful Savvy Senior Leaders. I'm Dr. Karen Wilson-Starks, your host. Welcome to the leadership show that's designed for you, the Successful Savvy Senior Leader. I am your host, Dr. Karen Wilson-Starks, and today we are talking about the Executive Success Profile, or in other words, what it takes to create the conditions for organizational success. There are really three primary tasks of senior leaders. The first task is selection. Secondly, it's individual development and integration. And thirdly, team development. So when you look at the Venn diagram that's displayed on your screen, you will see that there are three overlapping concentric circles. Now the circle that's on the left, this circle over here, is the one that's for executive selection. And the circle that's over here on the right, this one is actually for individual development in your organization. And then the third circle that's on the bottom, this is actually for team development. And when these are working synergistically together, what you end up getting is what we call the sweet spot of the success culture, and that's right in the middle of all three. So hopefully you can see that as well. So let's unpack that a little bit further. So as a senior leader, you have to think about these three components that you're sort of dialing in, selection, development, of individuals and development of the team, you have to think about these as dials that you're going to turn, that you're going to spin, and that you are going to tweak just to make sure that your environment is set up in the best way for organizational success. So one way you can sort of think about it is just imagine that you're at the eye doctor. And you know when you're at the eye doctor and you're going through the eye exam and the eye test, and let's say you're being fitted for glasses or for contact lenses, and then, you know, the eye doctor's dialing in different lenses and he's saying, which is better, number one or number two, which is better? And you go through that process because you're wanting to get the clearest vision and the clearest view possible with the lenses and dials that he's dialing in. Well, the same is true for your organization. As you dial in these three circles, you want to do it in such a way that you really get to that sweet spot in the middle which is the success culture. So we're going to talk a little bit about that because how you dial it makes a difference. So first let's talk about the selection circle. The selection circle is really about getting the right people with the right skills in the right jobs. Now there are some organizations that really have outgrown their current staff. They now need skills that they really don't have in-house. So those organizations have to go out and they really have to recruit people with new skills and new abilities because they don't have that in-house. Now in my case, I have historically and for the most part worked with very large global organizations, usually multinational big companies. In recent years, however, I've also had some clients that are more in the medium-sized company space. And a lot of these individuals, they are actually scaling from small size to medium or from medium to larger medium. And as they're scaling, what they find is that they need far more personnel and at a quick pace in order to really meet the market demand for whatever their services are and whatever it is that they do. And the more specialized the industry is that they're in, the harder it can be to recruit and to get the people that they want, and especially if they're in a smaller market or a less desirable location for any reason. So one of the things about my smaller clients is that sometimes they're not as equipped with the internal resources to help them identify and hire the right people. And what we know is that the wrong hires are costly. They're costly for any company and especially for a company that's already resource constrained like a small organization. So one of the things you want to think about is that there's this, this danger in, in an organization. If you don't have enough people, you end up overworking the few remaining and ultimately you're going to lose them too because they're going to get burned out 
And they're going to say, I don't want to work overtime every day. I don't want to work every weekend. And then you're going to actually lose your really good workforce that you've worked hard to, to train up and to get ready to, to add value in your organization. There's also a big cost and a lot of wasted time and money when you actually hire the wrong person. When you hire the wrong person and they don't have the skills, it really gums up the system. They're not able to do their part of the job to be able to pass the baton on to the, the next group who needs to take that work and do something else with it. And as the rest of the organization is getting frustrated by the person who's not able for whatever reason to do the work, whether it be because of skill or because of personality or work ethic and way of operating, then you also run into some morale problems and some friction and other difficulties that can happen. So you really don't want to have that morale problem and therefore again start losing the good people who are doing a great job for you. So when you're, when you're growing and when you're scaling as these medium-sized companies are doing, you're really having to add in a lot more of the right people to continue to be effective and to continue to be successful. So one of the things that I see as a picture in my mind is that very often these smaller organizations are trying to build, let's say, a house, metaphorically, that's 10,000 square feet. And they're trying to build that house on a foundation that's meant for a house that's maybe only 1,000 feet. Now, if you think about that long term and over time, if you're putting a 10,000 square foot house on a 1,000 square foot foundation, then something's going to crack, something's going to break, and something's not going to work or support the work of that organization over time. And so that's often what we run into is some form of a collapse that's actually happening because you don't have enough of the right people in place. So let me tell you a little bit about one of my clients who's actually in the manufacturing business. When we first met, they were actually in a very fast ramp-up mode. They had a lot more business than what they had been used to, and they were actually scaling from that medium size to now the larger medium size. And they found that they just they didn't have some of the talent that they needed in the organization, and they didn't have enough people. And so inside, they also didn't have yet the resources that they needed for how to select those right people. So we actually came alongside them and we helped them to identify what positions they needed to fill right away, what were the critical gap areas. And then we also helped them to think about, you know, how they would go about finding those people and assessing the candidates when they found them. And so we built some competency models for them so that they would be able to get the right hires in place. And once we did that, we, we also then developed some tools for them that they could use after we, had sh we showed them how to use those tools. So there was a do-it-yourself component that they could actually employ later for the additional level of hires that they needed to bring in. So they could do it yourself, they could also have it as a done-for-you service, and we did a little bit of both to help them actually get some advantage and some benefit. So, in these kind of situations, we find that what was happening for them and what can also happen for you is if you don't have those right people, other things start to happen. We find in those organizations that are strained like this, there are more mistakes that happen. And your employees are going to start taking shortcuts that are not helpful. And when they're taking shortcuts that aren't helpful, that's going to lead to also poor customer service, which is a problem. So you find your people working so hard, they just don't have the time for the process improvement. So it's not that they're evil, it's not that they're nefarious or that they don't care, but they are just stretched to the absolute limit and they need to have other people there. So think about them as barely remaining afloat, maybe having a hard time just keeping their heads above water. And because of all the stress, you're going to start seeing some other kind of physical, emotional, and mental strains. You're going to find people maybe getting short-tempered with each other, people forgetting important things that need to be done, and so on. So for all of these reasons, we want to make sure that your organizational foundation supports the size company that you are 
and the work that you need to do. So that selection piece is really huge. It's really important and for long-term sustainability and longevity in an organization. So let's move to the second area. The second area is the individual development and integration. So once you've got the right people, you've got to support those people in their jobs. One of the things we see is that people often leave organizations because after that initial kind of courtship of the recruitment process, and they're all excited, now they come into the company and they're left alone to fend for themselves. And these companies are very complex environments so they can't always easily figure out how to navigate in those systems and how to be effective. So your new employee ends up feeling undervalued and sometimes underutilized, and next thing you know, they're out the door again. And you've spent all of this energy and time and bringing in someone who was of high value to you. So you don't want to lose those people. And we, we notice that the more senior the role is for the person who's coming in, and the more complex the job that they have, and the more complex your organization as well, the more you also have to go beyond the onboarding period of 90 days to really implement what we call executive integration. Now, executive integration means that you are providing a, a whole um, safety net of support around that executive so that they get to know the teams that they're interfacing with, they get to know the company, the work that they're doing, they become a part of the fabric of your organization. This executive integration will take varying amounts of time, but let's say at least about a year. Because one of the things that you want, you want to see that executive through all the seasons and life cycles of the company. There are many people who lose key talent because the person is not supported through all of those life cycles. And the next thing you know, they're jumping ship prematurely or early because you're busy and you haven't had time to figure out what it is that they need to be successful. Sometimes that integration time is a little bit longer if the person who's coming into your industry is coming from a different area than your area of operation. They may have to have a steeper learning curve. They may have more that they have to dial in in order to be able to hit the ground running. So keep that in mind. One of the ways to think about this executive integration piece is to think about the fact that you are protecting your investment. So if you were to buy a very high value diamond ring, multiple carats, let's say. You wouldn't buy that diamond ring and then fail to also buy the insurance package that goes with it. Well, the executive integration is the insurance package because you've spent the time, the energy, the resources to bring that executive on board, and you want that person to be successful, and that's really what we're talking about. All right, so that's kind of like the part two where you're bringing in people and you're developing them and you're integrating them in to your organization. And remember, this is also the place where you're thinking about not only that person's skills for today, but also how they can continue to add value for tomorrow and the succession planning pieces as well. So where might they fit? You want to keep good people energized and challenged for the future. Because if they're not challenged, they have a tendency to go away and you probably don't want that to happen. The third part that we want to talk about is team development. Now, since high performance teams are actually doing the bulk of the work in successful and complex organizations, then you've got to invest also in the development of that team. So we know that part of team development is in that circle one, which is selection, first you're selecting the right individuals, and those individuals, if they're gonna be members of a high performance team, they have to perform at a level of excellence for the core skills and expertise that they're bringing to the job. And if they're not performing at that level of excellence, they're gonna drag the team down, and you're not going to have a high performance team. So that's one part of it. You also, of course, are going to be continuing to develop and integrate the, the individuals and personnel into the organization. That's a part of it. Now, the, the new piece is that we have to think about the team as its own entity. The team is almost like a person itself. So you want that team to also have its own development for success. 
And one of the things that the team most has to do is to become a learning organization. Think about your business environment. It's very dynamic. Things are changing constantly. So you want people who are learning every day and learning constantly, willing to shift and change, sometimes on a moment's notice, gathering data so that they know what's working and what's not working. So as a learning organization, team members are learning how to collaborate and co-create together. They are creating processes, next steps together as an entity. They are structuring their own um, processes and, and, and direction and objectives, and that's what you want. High performance teams are also attending to the relationships with one another. Because here's what we know, the real high value work gets done as a result of the relationships between the members on the high performance team. And that's why some attention to those relationships has to happen. That means ways that they communicate together, ways that they deal with conflict. There's so many pieces that, they, that they'll be talking about, including how they're gonna give each other feedback, the ways that they're going to specify the measurable outcomes for the work that they're doing, how they're gonna hold each other accountable, and ultimately how they'll begin to identify new opportunities for the team and also for the organization. So that's why that team development piece is so important. Now there is a sweet spot in the middle and that sweet spot in the middle is what we call the success culture. And in that sweet spot and in that success culture, what you're seeing is that you are inspiring people to greater success. You're building on the strengths of your team members and you're creating that stable platform or foundation for growth as you're building that 10,000 square foot or larger organization. So the success culture is actually an outcome rather than an input. It's actually an outcome rather than an input. And it's interesting because a lot of times people will come to me and they'll say, oh, we were having a problem with our culture and we need to get in there and fix the culture. And what I want to look at is I'm going to look at those three spinning dials and I'm going to see what needs to be tweaked there that is actually impacting the culture, whether it's positively or negatively. And invariably, 99.9% .9 of the time, there's something there that needs to be dialed in or dialed out in order for the success culture to really take effect. So one of the ways we want to think about the Venn diagram, let's go back to that in a way to just take a look at it. If any piece is missing, you're probably going to be missing some important value in the organization. And that's why I go back to that Venn diagram and see what we need to dial in or dial out in an organization. So for example, just imagine that you had the selection piece in and let's imagine that you had individual development and integration in, but you were missing team development, okay? So you've got selection, you've got individual development and integration, but you don't have team development. We would call this leaving money on the table. Now what that means is that you're doing some good stuff and you're doing well, you've got the right people, you're developing those people, you're integrating them into the organization. However, you are missing an opportunity because those good people, they actually are capable of doing more, they want to do more, and they want to continue to be challenged. So after a while, once they figure they've got your organization figured out, they may be looking for other challenge elsewhere. Whereas if you had the team part dialed in, those high performance teams are providing both challenge and also satisfaction every day. So it's not that anything is so horrible with having the right people and the individual development, you're just leaving money on the table in that case, okay? Now, let's imagine that you've got individual development and you've got team development, but you don't have the right people, all right? So you're developing your people you're integrating them into the organization, you're developing the team, but they're not the right people. Now that's pretty dangerous. <laughs> if you don't have the right people, I would say this is now throwing good money after bad. And when you're throwing good money after bad, here's what happens. 
your people are working too hard because it's like you have the wrong tools for the, for the job, in essence. So they're working too hard. You're not getting a proper return on investment, and you are going to lose good people because they're going to get sick and tired of that. After a while, the ones who are effective are going to leave and find other opportunity. So if you've got development going on, individual and team, but not the right people, that's good money being thrown out after bad. Now, if we come around the circle a, a little bit more, suppose you've got team development in place and you've got the right people in place, but you're not developing them on an individual level and you're not integrating them into the organization very well. Well, we call this insufficient investment. Insufficient investment. All of these are kind of like some money terms, but the bottom line is it's going to take too long for them to ramp up because they're not really getting the inputs that they need from you at that individual level and at that integration level. And because it's taking too long, they may feel stressed, frustrated and also undervalued and some of those people may leave too. Now the good news in this one is that at least in team development they are learning some skills and they are actually working together so it, there is some development going on but again we don't want the people to feel as though they're being thrown into the deep end of the pool and they don't have the basic swimming skills. So that's what I mean by looking at dials and all three of these circles and what you need to really focus in on to turn one way or the other. Now, you might be wondering how all of this might relate to maybe a couple of other pieces of the business that are important to talk about, and I want to add this in. The executive success profile relates very significantly to, to two other pieces of the business that I like to talk to people about, and I want you to know about it as well. One is achieving competitive advantage. As an organization, you want to be about identifying what is it that you do better than your competitors. And you want to understand how you can better serve your clients, how you can go past just being what we call the low-cost leader. You don't want to be competing on cost alone. You want to be bringing value. You want to be bringing value that your clients are looking for so you can serve better. That's achieving competitive advantage. The second thing you want to do is to become a best place to work. And as a best place to work, your employees, are, again, are feeling inspired, they're feeling challenged, and they want to add more value because of that. They feel appreciated. They're feeling utilized. They know that their gifts, their talents are deployed in ways that are fulfilling for them personally. So when you are dialing all these pieces together, you're actually creating the conditions for being able to get to competitive advantage and you're also creating the conditions of becoming a great place to work. Now keep this in mind, the way that you treat your employees is the way that they're going to treat your customers. And that's really going to impact competitive advantage and best place to work status. Now I want to give you an example. As a consultant, I'm out flying around frequently. I'm in airports a lot and I fly on airlines a lot. So this example is from the airline industry. Remember there was one time that I was out on a uh, coming back from a business trip and I got stuck on the highway getting to the airport in this city that's not my city uh, home city because I had a problem with my rental car. And it took a while to get that problem addressed. And as a result, I was late getting to the airport for my scheduled flight. Now, even though my flight was still on the ground, the, the, the counter agent told me, oh no, you have missed the time window, and therefore you're not gonna be allowed to proceed through security, you're not gonna be able to board this flight. And in fact, the counter agent said to me, I don't know what to tell you, but you're not catching this flight today. Now, having been in the airport many times, one of the things I know is that right about at that time, most other passengers would panic, they would start to freak out, and then they would start getting loud, and then they'd have a big altercation and a big mess ensues. And I've watched this happen in airports over and over again. 
So I decided, let me step back. I said, I'm a psychologist. Let me use some of my skills. Let me use some of my abilities to, to really assess the situation and see what's going on and see what options I really have. So when she said that, I said, oh, I said, oh, okay, so I'm going to miss the flight. And she said, oh, yeah, you're, you're not getting this flight. You're going to miss the flight. So then I said, well, okay, so um, what other options do I have? Now, mind you, I had very important work I needed to get back in town for the next day. And I'm thinking, oh, she's going to tell me there's no flight until the next day. And I'm very concerned about that. And so she says, well, I don't know. I'll have to look and see. I said, okay. I said, would you I'd be willing to check the screen and see what my options are? So she goes to the screen and said, well, there's a flight in an hour from now. And then she named some other flights. I was shocked. There were, there were several flights going to the next city where I needed to go. And so then I said, okay, so there's a flight in an hour. Are there any seats on that plane? And then she said, um, well, yes, there are some seats. Okay, I'd be willing to take that flight. What seat can you assign me? And so then she, she starts calming down a little bit, and she finds me a seat on the plane. And as I started talking to her, she's now going through all the process of doing all the stuff. What I learned is that here was a person who had been displaced from her hometown and city that she loved and wanted to be in. And when the airline had gone through a major upheaval, she had been transferred to this non-preferred city where she lived now. And she had to lift heavy suitcases at an advanced age when by this time, she really thought that she would be retired. So she was very bitter about this and she was very angry about that. And she was, and that really impacted how she was dealing with customers and clients such as me. Now, in my case, as I sort of heard more about her story, I was able to share some compassion. I was able to, you know, express some empathy. And she actually calmed down. And the next thing you know, I was on my flight heading back home as opposed to being carted away by the TSA agents. And so what I'm saying is that, again, how you treat your people really does spill out into terms of how they treat your customers, and that's a very important thing to keep in mind. The bottom line is through all of these processes that we're talking about, you want to see more leaders empowered for dynamic organizational results. That's what you want, more leaders empowered for dynamic organizational results. So today, we've been talking about the three circles of selection, getting the right people, Number two, individual development and integration. And number three, team development and how these lead to the sweet spot of the success culture. We've also been talking about how this whole process relates to creating competitive advantage and being a best place to work. So for your self-assessment, here are some questions for you. Where is your organization? on these executive success circles. Where are you? Which one of these three most needs to be dialed in for better results for you and your organization? And number three, what's the impact on your success culture of having the dials less than ideal, if that's what you find out? Because there is a cost that comes with having those dials less than ideal. So. Again, I want you to remember that this show is for you, the successful, savvy senior leader. So please write to me and let me know what you want to hear about next. I can be reached at Dr. Karen, Dr. Dr. Period, Karen, K-A-R-E-N, at transleadership.com. And before you go, let me share with you that Transleadership, my company, recently, we celebrated our 24th birthday. So I want you to join me for some virtual birthday cake and sparkling apple cider. Since you're at work still, sparkling apple cider, make sure that you get home safely. So please enjoy your cake and your sparkling cider while I share with you your thought for the day. So here's the thought for the day. When employees feel valued, they add value. When employees feel valued, they add value. So thanks for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you the next time.